I welcome you today to our May General Membership Luncheon. My name is Colin Hastings. I'm the Executive Director of the Pasco Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and we're thrilled today to have a presentation from the Washington Policy Center. And uh, Sean O'Brien is going to give us an update on this past legislative session. So it was a fun session. <laughs> he can tell you all about that. So at this time, I'd like to invite everyone to please join me in our Pledge of Allegiance. So if you could please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. You may have a seat. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce some of the elected officials that have joined us here today. Uh, First, I didn't see him come in, but I know that we were expecting Franklin County Commissioner Rocky Mullen. Rocky, did you sneak in? I don't see any hands coming up, so uh, I guess we can reserve those applause for Stu later. Uh, we do have from the Port of Pasco, we have Commissioners Jim Clinworth and Gene Reichman. If they want to stand up and be recognized, thank you. <laughs> and of course, from Franklin PUD, our favorite commissioner there. Stu Nelson, and we can give him applause for that. We do have a, a whole host of uh, board of directors from the Pasco Chamber here. I'd like to take a moment and recognize them and thank them for their service this year uh, as uh, uh, actively being on our board. Uh, of course, we have Kim Fall, we have Norm Rummel uh, with the Franklin PUD, Tim Brigman from STCU, Janet Mick with Minuteman Press, Rob D. Piazza is our president, and you'll get to hear from him a little bit later as he emcees this, uh, this monthly luncheon. Uh, James Sexton, Randy Hayden with the port, uh, uh, Christina Vieira, Edison Valerio, and I think somebody might have snuck in. Did I miss somebody that is on the, oh, Charles Grimm. I knew that somebody came in, Charles Grimm from Grocery Outlet. So let's, let's show our appreciation uh, to our board of directors uh, for their participation this year by a round of applause. <laughs> And of course, uh, um, that, that pathway wouldn't have been built without uh, our previous board members and presidents. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge their presence here. Uh, Daryl Ebert with the Dust Devils, Jason Hoag with American Family Insurance, Julie Killian uh, with Bank of Idaho, uh, Derek Brownson, uh, Joe Roach, and now John Schultz as well too. So I mean, he's, he's, he's the elder statesman here in the room today. So let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Um, so, for our chamber update, I first wanted to um, provide uh, our appreciation and thanks uh, for this past weekend. We had some uh, board members and, and uh, PASCO chamber members step up, uh, uh, Kelly with the chamber and myself were unavailable this weekend to do a ribbon cutting and participate in the Cinco de Mayo uh, uh, festivities and, and a judging a dance judge competition that we that we're a part of. So I do want to thank Tasha and Tim for helping us out uh, with the ribbon cutting. Tasha, Tim, if you could stand up, and I think that they were just expecting to be. They are just expecting to be uh, representatives at the ribbon cutting. However, I think they got hoisted into a speaking opportunity that wasn't by plan, but I'm glad that it worked out that way. So really appreciate that. And then Edison and Myra and Rolando Rodriguez uh, helped out with the Cinco de Mayo. Thank you so much for stepping up and, and, and helping us out at the Pasco Chamber. All right. So we do have some great opportunities for everyone to uh, participate in some great events that we have coming up uh, with the Pasco Chamber. First off, almost a month away is our Sagebrush Scramble. Um, I'm gonna have Megan and Kelly, we do have sign-up sheets going around, so if you're thinking about having a team for our, um, our tournament, um, I do have a slide on here with all the information. Of course, it's not working for me, it must be frozen. Um, but we do have teams available. If you uh, can't put a team together, we can always slide in a couple uh, singles together as well too. I know that we have one that's looking to join a team. So if you have any interest in that, throw your name and address down and we'll, we'll contact you. It's always a lot of fun. It's June 15th at Sun Willows. Um, we're providing lunch and dinner this year as well as a pretty cool uh, polo shirt with uh, our, our new logo that we unveiled last year. 
And then uh, right around the corner next week is our Dust Devils Night, uh, the pa Pasco Chamber Dust Devils Night, where we get together, we get access to uh, uh, pre-game, all-you-can-eat meal and refreshments, uh, and you get to have a chance to not network with all the Pasco Chamber uh, uh, members and all the peeps that are associated with the Pasco Chamber are interested in the Pasco Chamber. Right now, we actually have quite a few signed up, but uh, um, I know that Daryl and the Dust Devils would welcome more. It's always a good time, and, and the Chamber will do its best to make sure that the weather cooperates. It's part of our job as a Chamber to make sure we have Chamber days, and so we do kind of reserve those for our events as well. And then, uh, uh, not long after that uh, will be our Crawfest. So this is our fifth year doing uh, Crawfest. It's at a uh, uh, at Osprey Point. Um, it's something that, uh, as a chamber, we took upon as something that's a little bit different and, and kind of build upon what could be a, a, a festival. And we're starting to get there. I mean, heck, last year we had over 600 people uh, uh, turn out, and, and we went through almost 1,500 pounds of locally sourced crawfish. And so this year, our goal is to have uh, 2,000 pounds. It's, a lot of that is, well, it's like fishing. If you've ever been fishing, there's no guarantee. And so uh, it has to do with the weather and, and everything else. So we're, we're starting off a little cool. Uh, the, the crawfish do want a little bit warmer weather, but our goal is to get 2,000 pounds um, and have an even larger crowd, which I expect will happen. Uh, we have some great sponsors that are helping out with that. And we also have great live music that day uh, as well. So um, we'll be getting more information on that. And to wrap up, I want to kind of give everyone a heads up because I see a lot of uh, returning familiar faces that come to our luncheons. Our July luncheon will be a little bit different this time. Redline doesn't have space available uh, because they have a big conference. Uh, so instead of having a luncheon, we're going to have... We're gonna partner with the Pasco Posse and we're gonna have a picnic in the park at Osprey Point. Uh, so we're gonna take advantage of uh, maybe some of the tents that we'll have already set up for Crawfest and have an outdoor kind of networking free admission uh, event. Uh, we're searching still for a sponsor that will help us do that, but it'll be catered. And uh, we're gonna have some fun games and activities and a silent auction too. So. Uh, we'll uh, keep your eye out on that. We'll send out reminders, of course, when we get in July, because our goal is, even though it's pretty tough to um, have it happen, somebody will still show up here at the Red Lion on July 10th, <laughs> wondering where everybody's at. So uh, we're starting now to let everyone know. But uh, we appreciate uh, all your guys' uh, uh, support and, and coming here on this uh, uh, early spring day. And I guess at this point, we do have new members, and I don't know if our new members have showed up. Uh, I didn't, didn't see Carl Holder or Jace, Joseph Lee show up. Well, Rob, you're off the hooks, but it goes right to you. <laughs> so now uh, uh, please help me welcome uh, Rob DiPiazza, who is our 2022-23 Pasco Chamber president, who's going to take us through the rest of the program. All right, Rob, come on up. Thank you. Well, that was easy. Yeah. That was easy. I didn't have to pose, didn't have to smile, didn't have to do any of that. I'll smile for y'all. Anyway, thank you for being here, of course. We always appreciate those of you who come. Don't forget to network. Don't forget to bring a friend maybe next time. See if... Uh, they could be a possible Pasco Chamber member, but that's not a prerequisite. Just bring somebody to get to know everybody. So it is always a pleasure to introduce um, the keynote speakers because they're all like famous. <laughs> now, they're all really wonderful people. They have great things to share with us. Um, it's always a good opportunity to uh, learn. One of the things that we try to do here at the chamber, chamber is give you some information that you can actually take out and utilize uh, business-wise individuals. So we have Sean V. O'Brien, it says right there, so I'm going to put the V in there, uh, is Eastern Washington Director for the Washington Policy Center, advocating for all communities east of the Cascades. He is the former Executive Director for the Congressional Western Caucus, a coalition of 80 members of Congress whose 
Mission is to represent the voices of rural communities across the country in Washington, D.C. He also uh, previously served as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman Dan Newhouse. We know him, right? Yeah, we know him. Okay, good. Uh, he studied political science at Gonzaga University, uh, is, current, uh, is currently a member of the uh, Ag Forestry Leadership Programs, Class 43, not Class of 43, you're not old enough. It's Class 43. This is O'Brien's second experience with WPC, having served as a Janet and Doug True research intern with WPC uh, a decade ago. Uh, his first foray into public policy was in the office of Con Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. We also know her. Um, that's it, boss, you're up. I could have kept going, but the rest of it had nothing to do with him. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you. Um, as Rob pointed out, I uh, was recently living in Washington, D.C., actually for the last eight years, and uh, just in December moved to Tri-Cities. So I'm delighted to be a Tri-Cityan and to be back home uh, in Washington State. Um, as he mentioned, I spent those eight years with Congressman Newhouse, uh, the last two of which I served as the executive director for the Western Caucus, which he's the chairman of. And uh, that, that organization, that coalition of members of Congress exists to help balance out the fact that rural communities are so often not included in the real decision making in Washington, D.C. And I see this return home now with Washington Policy Center as their Eastern Washington director, very much um, in line with that same notion of it's so often that we on, on the east side of the Cascades are not included uh, in, in the discussions taking place in Olympia. We're drowned out by uh, Seattle and King County. And so I think that mission at the federal level and now at the state level is something that uh, I'm, I'm super passionate about. So. Uh, the intent today was to provide an opportunity to reflect on the legislative session that recently concluded, uh, but Colin and I were just joking. What we didn't know is that actually uh, we're now going to be looking forward to a special session that begins next week because the legislature did not get their job done. Uh, and that's really disappointing and frankly embarrassing because they had all the time in the world to do so and there's no reason that they shouldn't have have, uh, have, have gotten the job done. So I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more here. But just to start framing a little bit about what this legislative session uh, was really focusing on, with the governor's release of his proposed budget uh, at the end of last year, we knew that housing, homelessness, and crime were going to be very significant focuses. And that's something that shouldn't obviously be of news to any of us because we're seeing so many issues there. Um, and, and maybe I should just back up for a second and, and make sure that you all are familiar with Washington Policy Center. We are a public policy, free market-based think tank. Uh, we are nonpartisan. We're an independent think tank, so we don't respond or affiliate with any political parties. Um, but we certainly, again, we really root ourselves in that free market approach. We think uh, less taxes uh, helps spur economic development and growth for our state. Um, and so uh, just on that piece, we don't touch you know, social issues. Um, we're not getting involved in the abortion fight or the Second Amendment fight, issues like that. Uh, but again, going into this session, recognizing that the homelessness challenges uh, are something that uh, are so pivotal for so many communities across our state, east and west, we actually, for the first time, did put out uh, our policy proposals on housing and really focusing on countering that what we see is a misguided approach of housing first for anyone who needs it. And, and frankly, you can give uh, a drug addict uh, a mansion and that's not going to solve their struggles. And uh, we, we fundamentally disagree with this idea that, that housing has to come first. And we also disagree with the idea that 
housing is just an issue when it comes to the homelessness problem. And it's, it's not, it's a middle class problem as well. And, and we see that right here in Tri-Cities with the tremendous growth that we're facing. So for the first time, we put out a, a series of, uh, of our recommendations for uh, the legislature. And I think what I'll do is, is in recapping some of our issue areas is uh, we, we're housed in different centers from agriculture to transportation, healthcare, uh, small business, education. Um, <clears throat> so maybe what I'll do is I'll just uh, tack down a, a couple of the key issues on each of those. Um, but I, I will say on the housing piece, um, the governor had proposed a $4 billion proposal uh, to address the housing uh, crisis and uh, is, is the epitome from our perspective of just throwing money at a problem and not getting to the root of the issues. And I will say, you know, if we're going down a report card of how the legislative session went, the housing piece actually um, did not do much harm as we saw in a lot of other issue areas. Um, and, and fortunately it's in large part because the legislature just fundamentally rejected the governor's proposal. Um, and, and we actually saw some new regulatory relief and reform uh, that should help spur some of the ability to, to build more middle-class housing. So that's something that uh, was, was fairly positive. <clears throat> so maybe just starting at the top with agriculture, um, a, a few key issues that, that really uh, were a focus during this session. Some of you may recall last legislative session, something called the buffer bill was introduced, um, which would drastically expand the buffer zone between any waterway in our state and where a farmer can begin to actually work the land. Uh, with the proposal that came last legislative session, that fortunately died because of a lot of the strong advocacy of communities like, like those that you represent, <clears throat> It would have decimated our, our production by nearly 50%. I mean, it, it truly would have just radically and fundamentally changed our ability to, to grow and produce in the state. And so coming into this legislative session, we were really concerned that that was gonna rear its ugly head again. We were gonna see this same proposal come forward and we were gonna have to fight it again. And unfortunately, and, and this is probably one of the, the uh, small bright lights out of this session that I'll be sharing with you today is, the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, uh, a Democrat from the peninsula, Mike Chapman, from day one, this legislative session came in and said, no piece of legislation is going to pass this committee unless it's bipartisan. And that was a commitment that he chose to make. He, he, he was under no obligation. And I think that um, a lot, everyone in the room should be saying thank you to Mr. Chapman for being such a judicious and, and you know, good-spirited partner. And so what he did was he partnered with Representative Tom Dent, who some of you may know who represents Moses Lake, comes from Moses Lake. And together, uh, they created um, an alternative proposal on that buffer bill, something that was voluntary, was not... Uh, an edict coming out of Olympia that was going to decimate our ability to grow. And they pushed this bipartisan proposal that um, really could make a, a, a great impact on conservation issues in the state while helping our farmers and our salmon runs and our waterways and all these things. And the, the bill passed unanimously out of the Agriculture Committee. But one small issue, there was tremendous support across the board and just one individual who testified in opposition of the bill and that was a representative from the governor's office which thereby killed the bill. Uh, it, it, even though this passed the House Agriculture Committee and, and the House, uh, the Senate did not take up the bill due to that influence of the governor's office and um, uh, it's something that we feel is fundamentally just really disappointing. You saw this good-hearted well-intentioned and, and very, uh, what we thought was just great legislation developed on a bipartisan basis um, from folks from very different communities in, in our state. Um, it was supported by uh, several of, of our tribal friends on the west side of the state as well. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't move forward. We're, we're hopeful that next legislative session, that is something that we'll continue to be able to, to put forward and, and move, move forward with. Uh, uh, some of you may know the governor has announced he's not running for re-election. Um, so that, that's a, a fundamental reality that um, is, is going to impact just the overall dynamics there. But uh, so, you know, a bright light in the sense that this really uh, uh, 
positive uh, effort was made, um, but uh, certainly not across the finish line there. Um, maybe I'll jump down to education. Um, obviously, post-pandemic, learning loss is still uh, a key fundamental issue that our students are facing. You know, coming out of the pandemic, 70% of Washington State students were failing in math. 40, or excuse me, in English, you know, math. 70% in math, 40% in English. Um, uh, just truly, truly concerning issues there. And um, one key fact that we honed in on going into this legislative session is that there's nearly a billion dollars from the federal government that we have yet to spend that came in the, the form of COVID support. And so going into this session, our strong proposal was that that funding goes directly to students for extra tutoring time to be able to make up for some of that learning loss where we're seeing two to three years delay. And fortunately, there was actually bipartisan proposal in the Senate um, to do just that, to use that funding. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the legislation didn't even receive a hearing. Um, it, it was opposed um, by uh, the, the teachers unions in the state. And unfortunately, what we see as a, a complete pendulum swing from that idea is there was actually a proposal to cut time in classroom by an additional four hours. Um, fortunately, that, that did not move forward either. But again, with everything we're seeing you know, post-COVID, um, we fundamentally believe that th this funding could be used to, to support the students first and foremost, which should be the, the complete priority for our public education system. Um, on the environment side of things, um, many of you are aware that uh, the legislative, uh, the legislature, excuse me, uh, passed a carbon tax last session, and we're now starting to see uh, the repercussions of that. Uh, we have, as the Policy Center, have been comparing <clears throat> gas prices here in Washington State with our neighbors, and we are seeing an anywhere from a 33 to 58 percent increase in gas, and that is literally at our borders. You cross right into Idaho, right into Oregon, and they are not facing that same increase, and that's because of this carbon tax. Um, and unfortunately, the agreement for that tax was that agriculture would actually um, not be included, not have to face that, that increase in prices. And unfortunately, they are bearing the brunt of that. And <clears throat> there was some late last minute proposals to try and uh, fix that to make sure that agriculture uh, wasn't facing that increase. They did not move forward. And so that's one that I, we fully expect that there's going to be litigation. I um, fully expect that agriculture interests uh, will be suing the Department of Ecology in the state of Washington uh, because they're not fulfilling state law in that sense. Um, so some issues there. Um, and by the way, if, at any time, feel free to throw a hand up if you've got questions on anything. I'd love to, I don't want to be lecturing at you and I know I'm throwing a lot of information, so don't hesitate to let me know if there's any, any questions and, and I'd be happy to take questions uh, at the end as well. Um, we also have a center on government reform. Oh, please, Jean. I, that's so true, I, sh I should not have opened the floor up. No, please. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question was regarding the fact that, you know, our highways really need the support and, and the funding right now, um, and, and whether the electric vehicles, that, that whole dynamic, how that's playing into the funding uh, piece there. So I'll just take a step back and first say, um, this session, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, key, was keenly focused on the housing issue, and it wasn't one of our major transportation years. There was obviously a transportation budget passed, um, and and overall, that largely did go toward the continuation of ongoing highway projects and repairs. So overall, we we felt pretty positive there. The Senate worked in a bipartisan fashion to support that uh, that budget, so that was that was positive. Something that we are concerned about is a per mile tax coming. And that didn't move forward um, this session, but in the budget, there was a study p that passed that was included to, to use some funding to take a look at imposing that. And we know, first and foremost, that that's going to have detrimental effects on 
communities east of the Cascades and our agricultural regions. Um, that's something that we fundamentally oppose, but um, we're worried about, we, we, we see it coming. Um, on, the, on the EV piece, Gene, can you tell me a little more about what your question is on, on the funding or? Right. And that's, um, so that's exactly to the point of, um, we now know, that, you know, there are folks who, who want no more gas powered vehicles post 2030, which is, a, 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 again, just fundamentally drastic transformation in a very short period of time. But that's where I think this per mile fee is going to now replace the gas tax. That, 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 I think that's their ideological approach in, in doing so. You know, I can't speak to whether that was voted down before, but I don't know if you saw that one of the key pieces of bad news out of this legislative session is that advisory votes have now been removed. We will no longer, every time a tax increase is voted on in the legislature, um, and I think this was back in the 90s probably, that um, it, the vote now goes to uh, the people as well to affirm those increases. Um, the legislature unilaterally undid that. We no longer have those advisory votes, um, which uh, talking about government reform and transparency issues is something that we fundamentally disagree with uh, as well. The, uh, another key disappointment coming out of this session was um, not even a hearing held on emergency powers reforms. And you know, as you all know, um, the governor uh, operated under uh, the emergency COVID powers for 975 days, um, longer than anywhere we saw in the country. And, and, and even in you know, the, the, the bluest states or the reddest states or what have you across the country, a, lot, a majority of legislatures have some of those um, those powers so that the legislature has a say in some of these decision makings and not just a single person. And we thought it was really um, unfortunate that we couldn't even have a hearing to, to talk about that uh, proposal. And, and actually the proposal itself was bipartisan. There was um, a Democrat from the west side of the state, uh, Senator Mullet, who, who uh, pushed those reforms and that review forward. Uh, so, so we're disappointed on that piece. Did I see another hand over here? Okay, please. Yeah, uh, it's a, a really fair question and I appreciate that. Um, I think it goes to show um, the, the power of majorities in Olympia, right? And so just because you have, um, you know, some good actors who are wanting to really push forward on bipartisan proposals, at the end of the day, the majority reigns. And um, if there are majority interests uh, that want to push back on that, then, um, you know, the committee processes uh, or the floor processes will, will prevent uh, that, that action from taking place. So, um, d disappointing for sure. Um, let's see here. So, uh, on uh, moving to healthcare, just real quick, um, something that we are really excited about, a really positive uh, action that was taking place in the le legislature. <clears throat> 39 states across the country are a, per a part of a nurse licensure pact that basically says if you are qualified and have all the, the, the right um, um, qualifications to uh, nurse in one state or another that are a part of this pact and you move, you will automatically be able to jump right into the workforce and, and help fill the, the gap in, in, uh, in our state. We have over a need for over 2,000 nurses right now. Um, and so like I said, 39 states are a part of that pact. And fortunately, um, with our strong urging, um, we have just joined that. So we are state 40 now. Uh, so that if a, a nurse does move here from, from one of those other states, that they can jump right in and, and get to work rather than starting from the beginning with a process that could take months. Um, so we're, we're really feeling positive about that because of, of the, the dire need for 
for, for more nurses here. Um, let's see here, a big, big factor that I haven't touched upon yet um, that I'm sure many of you have heard about is the income tax uh, and the Supreme Court's ruling uh, that does indeed allow capital gains income tax to uh, begin operating here um, per <laughs> the fact that we as a state have voted 10 times a vote of the people to not have an income tax. Unfortunately, the Sur Supreme Court just overrode that. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the folks who are pushing for, for such a tax say, you know, this is only on the, the uber wealthy. It's not going to have uh, impacts on the middle class or low income families. Um, and, and, you know, firstly, we just fundamentally disagree with that perspective of how the economy works. We know that jobs will be lost because of this. We've already seen announcements of companies who are now moving their operations out of state because of this piece. But secondly, just to demonstrate what we see is the motivation on a lot of these fronts is um, that capital gains tax starts at anything made over $250,000. Well, there's already been a proposal to bring that threshold down all the way to 15,000 in the legislature. So we, we know that these, these things will, <laughs> they'll, they'll keep pushing the envelope there. And, um, and again, we, just, we fundamentally worry about the impacts that this will have on the ability to uh, attract new job growth, um, new, new businesses uh, in, in our state. And um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, as, as the Eastern Washington director, we have lots of friends uh, who live amongst our communities here who are saying, wow, Idaho's looking pretty good. And that's sad. Um, I think we all love our state. We all love our communities. And I think um, that just goes to show we, we've got something worth fighting for here. But um, it's, it's really concerning. Uh, it's, it's really worrying that we are going to lose um, uh, business opportunities uh, to neighboring states. Um, Please. Uh, first, I, I agree with your assessment on the impact to attract capital source, but so I'm going to ask you a legal question. Do you know, is that sort of ruling challengeable in the federal system? Thanks, Randy. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and, and there are, uh, the question was whether we can push back on that Supreme Court ruling. Um, the short answer is yes, and we, we are aware of uh, ongoing active conversations right now to do so on a multi-tiered front. One is the federal route, which is, um, at the end of the day, a very, very long stretch. And um, the, the, the hurdles to get all the way to the Supreme Court, um, it, it could be a decade from now. And by that point, our folks are gonna wanna continue spending money to go through that process. Uh, but uh, the second piece is uh, putting it up to a vote of the people. And so I fully expect, and, and I know there's ongoing conversations about whether this could be turned around in, in a short amount of period to be up for a vote this November, but there's more likely the opportunity to put this up for a vote to the people next November um, when we are in a full presidential cycle, voter turnout, all, all of those things. So, um, and, and you know, if we need to, we've done it 10 times, we've, <laughs> we've opposed an income tax. I think we'll probably do it in 11th, um, as long as all of those chips fall in a row. So we are, we're hopeful in that sense, but I will tell you, the, just to demonstrate how um, volatile this uh, source of funding is, the state thought that they would raise somewhere around 500 million from this new capital gains income tax. We just saw the numbers came through just from filing season here in April, and they've already raised over 900 million. And they have more than 1,500 folks who have asked for an extension. So we fully expect that they will raise over $1 billion. $1 billion in the, with this new uh, capital gains tax. Um, it's a phenomenal amount of money. Um, and, and I'll just say, most uh, political uh, folks say that a uh, successful initiative should only take about, not only, but should take about $12 million to fund, um, getting out the, the signatures and all those, those efforts. We just had Washington State residents pay over 900 million 
we think that there's probably some motivation to be able to support that $12 million effort. And, and I should be careful to say when I say we, we again are a, a nonprofit, um, so that is not our role. We will not be leading that by any means, but we will certainly be, be providing the facts and the statistics and the studies uh, to help de demonstrate the, the detrimental effect that this will have on, on our state. So um, maybe, yeah, I'll pause there and see if there's, there's other questions. And again, I know I, I threw a lot at you and, and did not cover a lot. Uh, there was um, thousands of bills proposed uh, in uh, this past legislative session. So um, it's, you know, I think we have a state dinosaur that's officially been designated now. Why that's a priority, I, I don't know, but um, folks thought to do so. So, uh, <laughs> but um, other questions from the room? I hope it wasn't too doom and gloom. Um, like I said, we, we like to point out the bipartisan proposals and the, and the, and the good policy, and we, we wanna give as much credit and support to those efforts as we can, um, but also call out when we see concerning uh, proposals and, and policies as well. Please. Ooh. I wish, most of you probably know my colleague, Jason Mercier, uh, who um, is our tax guru and has been with us for over 20 years and um, is, is a, a phenomenal uh, advocate on this front. I, I probably shouldn't try to speak to it uh, as much, so uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll find you after and make sure you get my card and I can get you connected there to answer that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the question was, you know, some folks have advocated the idea of, of breaking the state off and, and joining uh, joining Idaho or joining a new state, those kind of things. I, I haven't heard any serious proposals there. Um, and, and, you know, I, in some ways we can look at that lightheartedly. Um, and in other ways, you know, I, I think that's where I, I, I want to also make sure that that going back to that idea that we're worth fighting for, right? We, we uh, it, it could be challenging uh, with with so many things going the other way um, in Olympia, but at the end of the day, I think um, we should be proud Washingtonians, and and rather than the idea of cutting and running, let's um, let's keep fighting for for the good policy. It's kind of where I would I would throw back that. Please. Hmm. Yeah, uh, great question. And um, again, uh, the question was on housing and um, rent control proposals. Um, those we fundamentally oppose uh, as a policy center. And um, uh, part of our proposals for the ho for the housing issues was was to oppose that. Luckily, that did die. Um, so I I'll say. Um, up until the very last minute, there were several proposals, property tax increase, REIT tax increase. Um, uh, fortunately, they did not move forward. And so that's where I go back again and say, overall, things looked pretty good on the housing front. Um, and uh, there were even a few small but meaningful regulatory reforms that we, again, think that could help spur the ability to to, to build houses just a little bit more easily. So, um, but, but luckily that rent control proposal did die um, with, with our encouragement. So with the special session, that was a specific Great question, thanks Colin. So the question was, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a special session that's being called next week, May 16th, it starts. And the question was whether they are focusing just on a singular issue or if they could do others. Um, the ability is there to focus on other issues, but everything that we're hearing is it's gonna focus on the one. And and I should not assume um, that, that folks have heard what that issue is. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the Blake decision, which was that um, court case that uh, essentially has legalized drug possession in our state. And if the legislature doesn't act by July 1, we do move into de facto drug legalization uh, possession, of, of possession. Um, again, I go back to the, there was no excuse that the legislature should not have gotten this fix done during their set uh, schedule, and in fact, the governor came out the second to last day of the session, proclaiming 
they've got a deal, it's all done, let's go to the floor. And they brought it to the floor and the vote died. It failed. And, um, you know, the, there are, there's a Democratic majority in the House, a Democratic majority in the Senate, and a Democratic uh, governor. We thought that they should do their jobs and, and, and get this fixed on, um, but they were not able to do so. They lost Democratic votes on their own bill. Um, so this special session is being called to address that issue. Uh, a concern we're having is the fact that the governor had said he would not order the session until an agreement was made, and yet he ended up calling one, and we hear from all of the leadership that, no, we, we're not there yet. We don't, we don't have a, a, an agreed upon plan yet. So next week could end up getting dragged out a bit. It, it, really, it should be one day. Um, they should come in, vote, have the done, have it, have it get the job done and, and move on. Um, and as of right now, we have not heard that there is that agreement. So um, many uh, localities um, across the state have taken it upon themselves to say, hey, we're not waiting for the legislature to do their job because if we hit July 1, we are going to see, I mean, we're already dealing with so many of these crime issues. Who knows what we're going to have to face if we do that? So many cities across the state are saying, all right, we'll, put on, we'll, we'll legislate ourselves so that at least the city of Cedro Woolley will have it that, no, you can't possess meth and have that be legal. Like, it's just <laughs> some, some fundamental facts there. So, um, yeah, next week could get a little messy, a little sloppy, we're, but we're hopeful that, um, well, we hope that they uh, do get the job done because, um, Again, the, the crime issues are, are, are having a fundamental impact, uh, impact on, uh, on, on our economies and public safety, so. Was that, so was that the, regarding the um, local property taxes cap? Is that what you're referring to? You know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there. Um, there, there was a proposal, um, again, one of the last uh, couple days of the session, there was a proposal to allow localities to increase their property taxes from 1% to 3%. Um, and I, I believe the Washington Association of Cities um, did support that proposal for, for local budgetary reasons. Um, the proposal did not move forward, um, but I'm not sure if that's necessarily um, uh, regarding your question there. So again, happy to, to get you my card and we can run that down for you. Yeah, I think, uh, again, the income tax piece was um, uh, the number one big issue from the last few months. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say the the first day of the legislature, um, I I was in Olympia, and, you know, a key perspective for for what I, how I approach my job is I need to be out here in eastern Washington listening to communities and leaders about what, what impacts their, their ability to do their jobs and uh, to grow, et cetera. Uh, but also on the flip side, I need to be in Olympia and, and make sure that um, our legislators from across the state are, are hearing that message that I'm bringing back. And I walked into a coffee shop just down the street from the Capitol and there was this sign on the counter um, that was laminated and it had clearly been there for several months. And it was this long explanation of all of the, the price increases that this little bakery was going through, post-COVID, post-taxes, post all of these struggles. And I, I took a photo of it and, and did some, just some writing about this, this laminated piece of paper is our motivation. We need to be doing, and we as in the legislature, need to be doing everything we can to try and lighten the burden that these small mom and pop shops are facing. And um, I can't tell you that the legislature did much to do that. Um, and uh, I think 
I think there's that fundamental disconnect of, again, we gotta listen to folks. And here's, you know, right in the heart of downtown Olympia, this small mom and pop shop that it's been there for decades, the, the, that piece of paper kind of told their story and, and, and it laid out all of the increases from the price of flour. And uh, it, it, again, I, I think it should be seen as um, an opportunity for motivation, not necessarily a criticism. Uh, but I, I, again, I, I can't tell you that there was much relief provided um, for small businesses across the state um, when it came to this this past session. Yeah. No, there wasn't much discussion on minimum wage this session, um, but something that I should touch upon on back on the agriculture front is the um, overtime pay mandate that um, the legislature put into place last session. And you know that threshold is now each year um, uh, going shorter and shorter. Um, really, really fascinating moment in this session took place when um, farm workers were invited to, to testify on the impacts of that, that overtime piece. And we had some um, Spanish-speaking farm workers from the Acoma Valley who were testifying um, in Spanish. And um, a, a West Side state senator, her name is Rebecca Saldana, she was a part of the committee hearing, but she also took it upon herself to be the translator. Even though a third-party translator was there present to do that job. And um, unfortunately, she... Um, not only uh, added her own additional narrative when she was translating for them, she also, when they were saying, hey, this is hurting us, we want the hours, we, we, want, the t we want to work, we want the time, she said, well, clearly they haven't been given all the facts. And we found that that was just fundamentally demeaning. Um, they, no differently than anyone else in our state, have the ability to come testify their legislature. And the idea that not only would their words be misconstrued, but also that they would be demeaned to say, oh, well, they clearly don't have all the information, um, was wrong. And there was no uh, repercussions from what we see as actually just a, a complete misuse of the, <laughs> the legislative process there. Um, there needs to be some, again, transparency um, and accountability for these processes in Olympia. And um, so that, that, was, that was a really, really galling moment uh, that we were disappointed about. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, as I mentioned, I was with Congressman Newhouse for the last eight years, and that's how I got to know and fall in love with Tri-Cities. Uh, it was coming home uh, so often. I, I did not grow up in Tri-Cities. I grew up uh, just outside of Portland and then went to Gonzaga for college. Uh, but it was coming here because I was our um, Hanford, PNNL, Snake River Dams, Columbia River uh, staffer, and those those were my issues, and that's where I got to know so many of the leaders in this room, and fall in love with the communities. And I've got one of my best friends from college, uh, BJ here, who's raising his family here, and I. That's my passion is is the love that I see that this community has for for this community. Um, it's I, I think Trace Cities is. Um, is really unique about how engaged we are. And I think that key piece is we do have such a long history and legacy of a federal footprint. And something that I'm really excited about is trying to bring some of the good ideas that may be happening in DC or Olympia or the bad ideas and helping collaborate a little bit. Let's learn from each other, let's engage here. You know, we have Congresswoman McMorris Rogers, who's now the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, an incredible platform. Mr. Newhouse is chairman of the Western Caucus. I think we have uh, really awesome opportunities here to engage and lean in on providing leadership, not just for the region and the state, but also just at a national level, um, and telling our story. And so that's something that, you know, here we are, we're a 
we're a, we're a bunch of policy wonks and nerds, but for me, it's that community-driven focus that really drives my, my passion. And so I'm excited to help apply the policy at the state and federal level, but also engage um, local communities. And um, I think you know, your, your local chamber of commerce is the, at the epitome of the on-the-ground worker of, of trying to support those efforts. So, um, so I'm, I'm just grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be, to be home and to be uh, a Tricidian. Jean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point. Um, no, that's a great point. Unfortunately, the legislature is, again, they include it in their budget, more studies uh, on, on the system. And, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll admit, I, I was pretty frustrated at the end of that um, Murray Inslee whole effort uh, because, you know, some people were saying, oh, we should thank them because uh, they, they, they chose to not breach the dams. And um, I, I just fundamentally have to disagree with that approach. You know, let's look at the Grain Commission. Very small budget, very important budget that helps expand markets for our growers. Instead of using post-COVID their small amount of funding to help provide those new markets for farmers, they instead had to play defense with this whole new study process and utilize their resources to do to to get all of the information and uh, and and facts to be a part of that Murray Inslee study. That has direct repercussions on our communities and on our farmers. And so this idea that, um, first of all, they didn't have the authority to choose to breach the dams anyways. That solely lies with Congress. But the big issue is that I don't see that we're ever going to reach a point where one day all of a sudden, all right, it's happening, we're breaching the dams. It's death by a thousand cuts. It's all of the regulatory impacts that agencies and the administration continue to, to pound away on. And meanwhile, again, you know, I go back to that storytelling about how we are providing leadership. I mean, we have world-class technology being utilized at these dams that truly communities across the globe should be looking at these turbines and the work that PNNL is doing on the fish sensors. And so the fact that we do have this clean, affordable power plus world-class fish passage to support our, our species should, should demonstrate that this is a positive story to be telling, but unfortunately it's an ideological battle that's being waged that um, I just don't think will ever go away. And, but I think that just means all the more that we have to continue to, to tell that story uh, in a positive fashion. And um, again, we can be leaders, we are leaders on clean energy uh, for, the, for the nation, and uh, we should be proud of that. Um, and I think, you know, with a lot of folks that are in this room, we'll be able to keep doing that. Leave it there. Thank you. All right. All right, here comes the fun part. Hello, here comes the fun part. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I'd like to thank the Red Lion uh, for hosting us today. Uh, our TV group back there with our producer, director, cameraman, John. <laughs> um, and then we have a door prize. All right. Uh, Carla Martinez. Looks like a very pretty pink basket, just in time for Mother's Day. Uh, let's see, for those of you who are members of the posse that can hang out for a few minutes after the meeting, that would be great. Just got a little short subject that we need to cover. Otherwise, sagebrush scramble again. Mention that, it's coming up really quick. If you could put a team together, that would be great. Or sponsorship level, and keep crawfish, in mind, 
And uh, what's the other thing? No, there's something else. I'll figure it out later. I'll send you an email, I promise. All right, thank you all for being here. Y'all have a great week.